riddles can help us unravel the mysteries of who we are and where we've come from. So over to you, Professor. Thank you very much. So good evening to all of you. I uh, understand that this is the time of the online learning, online uh, entertainment, everything online. I hope uh, I'll do some justice. Uh, I think the title must be very catchy and some of the description uh, that is passed on to all of you uh, must be very attractive. Uh, I hope I'll do some justice because many times what happens is, you know, when, when we pass on the information, we sort of sugarcoat the you know, information. When you get into the details, uh, you know, often uh, you may sort of feel that it is disconnected, but I'll try and say, you know, make sure that every slide of mine is connected to what I'm going to talk about, right? So uh, let me share my slides. Okay, so, uh, you know, what science does is, is basically helping us to understand uh, the world beyond our own sensory perception. We see, we hear, we smell the world, uh, but we make you know, some kind of a picture of the world, but not necessarily that's the true picture of the world. So how do we know which is the true picture of the world? So obviously we can actually compare our observation with our observation of our neighbors. And if they also observe the same thing, how do we know then you know, which is the real world? You know, philosophers, scientists, you know, thinkers, you know, ordinary people, everybody was asking the same question. What we hear, what we see, is it the real? And if not, what is reality, right? But using the methods of science, using the certain technology like microscope and telescope, finally we started unraveling the reality of the world, which is beyond our own sensory perception. Uh, you know, the best example, you know, even today, uh, we don't really see that it is the earth which moves around the sun. But, you know, although colloquially we keep saying that, you know, sun rises from the east and sets in the west, but in reality, it is the we are the one, or the earth is the one which moves around the, around the sun, right? So I don't want to get into the details of this. But even when you ask more complex questions, like what is life, right? We have a, some understanding of what is life, all of us. We know that we are living organism. We know that, you know, many animals that we see, many plants that we see, many, you know, animals and plants that we eat, or, you know, those we watch on national, you know, geographic television, all the biodiversity that David Attenborough sort of describes at length, all of that, we know that they are all living organisms. Then the question comes still, you know, what is really life, right? It's a very complex phenomenon. How would actually one want, like to even start answering this? So one way people thought sometime, you know, early on, a couple of hundred years ago, of course, uh, you know, well studied and, uh, you know, steered this whole field by Gregor Mendel was if you want to understand life, one of the characteristic of life is we pass on features of one particular species to the next generation when the organism reproduces, right? So there are certain characteristic of life sort of characteristic that we can see from outside. For example, a human being with two eyes and two ears and two hands or a, or a pea plant with certain kinds of flower arrangements, certain kinds of you know, colors in the flowers, whatever the characters that we can talk about, how these are inherited, right? If you understand this, hopefully that will be at least a beginning of to understand life because that gives you a clue or at least a starting point to understand life. So that's how, you know, the initial studies at the systematic level, I'm talking about more systematic experimental work related to, or even not an experimental, but even more observational one, started with, uh, you know, Gregor Mendel when he studied uh, pea plant and tried to understand, is there a pattern in which characteristics are inherited from the parents to the offspring? Uh, all the you know the laws of genetics i don't want to repeat this but at least he showed that there is a particular pattern and this pattern is somewhat similar across all organisms that is going through reproductive you know sexual reproduction so to that extent he could start a new field called genetics or study of inheritance in which one could actually start understanding okay here is one right if i inherit this or if I don't inherit this, why don't I inherit something other than, you know, my parents are passing on to my brothers or my sister, then we can actually start understanding to some aspects of life. Then comes Darwin and Darwin studied in a very different context. He said, to understand life, first we have to understand 
to what extent we are related to other organism, to what extent our so-called life of a human is different or similar to the life of other organisms. It could be a bacteria, it could be a plant or, a, or, or, or an other animals, right? So the entire, you know, the, the biodiversity that we see in the natural world, can we sort of understand in totality the whole life on earth, right? So that is the route that Darwin took. And as you all know, according to the theory of evolution, we are all related, right? So in which has been, of course, you know, proven many, many times beyond doubt now that we are all related. The way we are related amongst our own siblings, of, you know, the children of the same parents or amongst our first cousins or second cousins, right? So all organisms are related. Of course, they are at a very different time scale, you know, evolutionary time scale. It could be millions of years or it could be billions of years, right? The life on Earth is close to about 3.5 billion year old. So it gave another angle to life that perhaps if we try to understand the life of one particular organism in more detail, because you know, to understand life, we need to understand all about it. And we need to understand our birth. We need to understand our, our whatever the time that we live and, and then how we feel what we, you know, about ourselves, how we you know, compare ourselves with the rest of the you know, organisms in the world, and how we take decisions, how you know, we uh, you know, pass on the characters to the next generation. If you want to understand all of it, then only we can understand the life in totality. Right? So that's where the importance of monal organism emerged, because if all of us are related, in fact, Darwin himself mentioned that perhaps there is one uh, you know, common origin of life. If all of us are related, then if we study one or two model organisms, hopefully we'll be able to understand life in totality, right? So this is when, uh, you know, one of the most famous model organisms ever studied came into uh, research arena. That's the Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. Uh, the one which I'm sure all of you have seen it, uh, if not under microscope, at least uh, at your home. Uh, you know, wherever there's a banana, I'm sure uh, there would be a, a fruit fly, right? And the reason it was picked up for many variety of, you know, reasons, one of them is uh, it's easy to grow. You just give some bananas or, you know, or, or uh, corn flour along with some yeast and its life cycle is just for two weeks. You know, the whole, you know, the, the generation is turned around within two weeks at 25 degrees centigrade. And so it was easy to study and it is microscope enough to you know, grow them in a very large number in the laboratory. At the same time, it is large enough to see at 5x magnification, just five times magnification with the help of a magnifying glass, you can actually see a lot of details of this fly, you know, unlike a bacteria, right? So one of the first you know, discoveries that help the, uh, you know, the scientists made with the help of uh, model organism Drosophila is what exactly is the genetic material itself, right? All Mendel's work was Darwin's work about genetic variations. All of them are basically an abstract understanding of what is passed on from one generation to another generation. So using Drosophila genetics, you know, the scientists showed that it, the chromosomes are the genetic material. Chromosomes are the ones which are inherited from organism to organism. And chromosomes are the ones which carry genetic information to make the whole organism. And also for all its activity, whatever is required, everything is there in the chromosomes. Of course, it's only a machine. Depending on the environment, it will, you know, modulate its behavior, which I'll come to that in a minute, right? So when this discovery was made, and with the help of other, you know, simpler model organisms, particularly bacteria and the viruses which infect bacteria, people showed that there is chemically the chromosomes are made up of what are known as nucleic acid. The nucleic acid are the genetic material. We know now it's the DNA. All of you, you know, know about DNA. Don't worry about you know the long form of the DNA. Even if you don't know, I'm sure all of you have heard the word DNA. DNA is the genetic material. It has a particular chemical way of coding genetic information. The genetic information is to make a particular protein, and which protein? is uh, encoded by a particular gene will tell you what the gene is corresponding to. For example, a protein required for the, for the eye color or protein required for the skin color or protein required for the hair color would be encoded by a, a particular gene. And then you can say that gene codes for hair color, this gene codes for you know, eye color and so forth. And that's what we inherit from our parents, right? Now, there is a particular method in which the information is coded. I'll not get into the chemistry of it, 
and those who have already know a little bit about it, we can easily make out from the picture that I'm showing you here. Uh, there are multi, there are two types of chemical entities, and when the when they make pairs, you know, there are basically two types of pairs, and that in that basically helps to build the information to carry the genetic information in a stable way, and also in a high fidelity way to the next generation. High fidelity means there should not be any, you know, changes from generation after generation. For example, you know we always see that a human being gives rise to another human being, right? Uh, an insect gives rise to another insect. But thousands of generations, it can happen in a very stable way. At the same time, there can be small variations. We all see small variations. For example, we don't look alike, completely like our parents, but we are, you know, we know for sure that we are human beings because my, our parents were human beings. And we also know that to a large extent, we also are very similar to our parents, right? To, but at the same time, there can be an error in the chemical information at the time of synthesis of DNA. And that variations are the one which will, you know, lead to new genetic variation in the population, right? The best example I can give you again from your school textbook is in the hemoglobin example. So hemoglobin is, as you all know, it's present in the red blood cells to carry oxygen, um, you know, uh, from lungs through the heart to the whole of the body, right? And the particular sequence of chemical entities in the DNA corresponding to the sequence of amino acids in the protein, hemoglobin is a protein, corresponding gene uh, is, is a nucleic acid based uh, you know, information, which is what you call DNA, right? And if there is a small change, just one letter change, for example, in the seventh position here, seventh codon, we call seventh you know, uh, amino acid we call in the protein, instead of GAG, if it is GTG, you get a different amino acid, then it's chemically different, you know, entity. If it is chemically different entity, then for example, if you look at Lego block, you know, say one of the blocks has a kink and that won't fit in properly to the you know, whole, you know, the building, right? That you want to build using Lego blocks. Similarly, when hemoglobin has such a problem, you don't get a very nice, you know, disc shaped, you know, RBCs. Instead, you get a sickle cell RBC. This is what sickle cell RBC is called. And because this hemoglobin is less efficient in oxygen transfer, what happens is the at people at higher altitude where oxygen levels are lower will have anemic phenotype because they have a problem in oxygen exchange. But if they are in the mean sea level where oxygen concentration is higher, obviously they will not have that problem, right? Whereas interestingly, the same individuals who are you considered as you know maybe anemic they are diseased people or you know maybe they have a you know less you know stable compared to the normal RBCs and all if they are in mean sea level and also in an area where there is malaria is prevalent in fact the people with sickle cell hemoglobin are better off particularly with their heterozygous compared to the normal one so-called normal ones because the malarial parasite can easily invade our regular RBCs, but they cannot invade sickle cell RBCs, right? So as you can make out what we call as, as, as you know, the organism is, you know, which fits a particular environment, or which genotype is, you know, is better depends on the environment in which the, you know, the organism lives, right? It's very relative to the environment in which it's living. So this is basically what called genotype and environment interaction to give a particular type of phenotype. Phenotype is the, the character that we see and measure. And over the time, thousands of years or millions of years and even billions of years, this whole genetic variation that we have seen within the population, between the population is what has led to all kinds of biodiversity that ever existed on Earth and also what exists today. Fortunately, we still have something in the context of climate change, it's all going down and we need to protect, but still, you know, there is sufficient biodiversity for us to, you know, uh, enjoy and also at the same time, take the responsibility to protect them, right? Okay, now coming back to the question of life. Did we answer the question of life? No, because the question of life, we still got only certain clues, right? We said, okay, if I inherit certain features from the parents, maybe that will tell us to some extent how we actually inherit the so-called the, the life as a property in me. Or it, what the way Darwin you know, proposed that perhaps the features of life is common across all organisms with some small variations. That small variation is what makes us human and some other organism, chimpanzee or 
you know, uh, or a mouse or a, or, a, or a fly, right? So coming back to question of life itself, people started looking at cellular form of life and they found out that cell is can not only as a unit of life, cell can be life itself, right? So if you understand the cell, hopefully we'll be able to understand the life, right? So for example, here is, is one of the, you know, uh, immune cells in our body and which is trying to chase a bacteria. It looks like as if it is moving with a purpose and it can see where the bacteria is, at least sense. See means not necessarily with a visual perception. And it's going after the bacteria chasing and finally it engulfs the bacteria at some point, as you can see here, and sort of suggesting that this is, you know, maybe the life itself. And if I understand a self, hopefully we'll understand the life in, in much better way, right? So that's when the whole new field started, what is known as cell biology, the structure function relationship studies, all these cell and molecular biology, you must have heard about, you know, in variety of different platforms or in from your school textbook and otherwise, is all related to understanding the whole cell as, as a one entity, because all features of life is there in a cell because cell can behave as a life, right? Already there are many, many unicellular organisms which we know. Amoeba is a unicellular organism, a bacteria is a unicellular organism. And if it can survive on its own, it can, you know, uh, live and reproduce and then move on, uh, you know, to the next generation. And then it's going on for millions of years. Then why do we need to even study anything else? You know, just study the cell itself. But however, cell gives only to some extent that information, but finally, for our satisfaction and also for academic curiosity and also to uh, for the practical reason to understand human uh, individuals at the population as well as individual level we need to understand self at our level that is what is known as a multicellular level right we are made up of several cells for example a human body is made up of close to about 100 trillion cells but we all start with one cell so that's when people started looking at if I want to understand life, first of all, if better to understand my life, because that's understanding self is more important, right? Because without understanding myself, how do I understand that I have understood life, right? So that should be the ultimate goal of understanding life. So to that, to initiate that one, people started looking at how do we even start our life, right? I start as a life as a one cell, when the egg from the mother and the sperm of the father is fused with fertilized and it becomes a single cell embryo later it becomes what is known as a fetus and then grows for nine months and then a young you know a kid comes out and this infant over two to three years later come, becomes so independent then started you know making its own decisions it's moving around on its own starts going to the school and then goes to you know many things and then becomes totally independent in every sense of the world right so if you understand the beginning of this, that is from one single cell entity to become a, an independent individual over the first nine months to become a baby and then another three to four years until it becomes totally independent, hopefully we'll be able to explain all about life, at least in the context of human, right? So this is the beginning of uh, an area called developmental biology to understand it finer details how we do develop into a multicellular organism starting from a single cell, right? So, uh, you know, uh, sorry, I should have played this while talking about this. This is basically, you know, it's if you pick, see a picture of a, an embryo dividing and, you know, dividing and dividing and, you know, reorganizing itself and then slowly becoming an, an organism. In this case, it's a fish embryo because it's easy to, you know, see under microscope and we film this video of this and uh, a tadpole will emerge within 24 to 25 hours, but that's not going to explain everything that we want to understand, right? Most importantly, to understand what is known as a pattern formation, right? We need to understand that we, how do we see, how do we see eyes only in this place? Why not everywhere else? Why do we see ears only here and where on, why not in any other places, right? These are the kind of questions you should ask first, right? Where is the, what is the mechanism by which in, the very different parts of the body is located along the axis, what you call anterior posterior axis. My head is called anterior side and the other end is called posterior. And the where my mouth is called ventral side and the other side is called dorsal side, right? So along the two axes, at least to start with, how are these, you know, very different organs and tissues are all, you know, positioned because unless they are positioned in a proper way, we cannot have a, a, a human being, which is complete, and say that you know we have you know 
become uh, an independent living organism. So uh, this is where the position information comes into picture. In a left-right asymmetry, you know, symmetry kind of area, we see most of the insects and other organisms. You can see that, you know, the the position information is easy to, you know, con, you know, uh, assign with the help of two axes, x and y axis. All of you do regularly in your life, right? But if you want to have a, some kind of an asymmetry along the bilateral uh, asymmetry, in like what we have in human, like heart is on one side and the liver on the other side, you need three axes, X, Y, and Z axis. But human also mostly bilaterally symmetrical, except for one or two features like heart, right? So to understand this process, what Drosophila has given us, you know, a complete picture. Unfortunately, uh, you know, with the, we want to keep the talk very short and I'll try to, you know, fast track on this one very quickly. So uh, it's very interesting, you know, the, what is really important is the, in the context of evolution, already the mother has all the features of life, right? Mother has its an anterior, which has the, the opposite end, a dorsal and ventral side. If mother transfer that information, positional information to the egg, right? And that is what can carry to the next generation. So what we need to understand is how mother transfer that information to the egg, right? And if you understand that, hopefully we'll be able to understand the rest of the processes. And through, with the help of Drosophila, all of these things have been, you know, discovered and explained in greater detail to an extent that now we know that it's exact, more or less similar kind of mechanism exists in other organisms, including in human, right? So one of the ways it can do is, first is an egg is unpolarized one, it is made to polarized. And with the help of simply a, a movement of the nurse cells towards you know, one end, nurse cells are the ones which actually help the oocyte or the future egg, uh, you know, which is basically kept as dormant because too much is the activity, more ener you know, entropy is the error errors. We don't want an egg to develop any such kind of errors. So egg is always kept at the low energy levels. So, and the oocyte develops some kind of polarity to start with. It knows its two ends are too different. And then, uh, you know, a nucleic acid related to one of the master control gene is deposited on one egg. But its protein, when it is translated, as you know, the, you know, the information that is coded in the gene is to make a protein, and the protein sort of diffuses and form a gradient. The way, you know, our viral particles, when we exhale, make a gradient, everybody is keep hearing in, in the television channels these days, right? So as you can see here, there is a one source of genetic information Whereas its protein is the product is can diffuse. When it diffuses, it forms a gradient. Now, depending on the amount of protein that is present in different parts of the embryo, different you know, types of tissues develop along the axis. This is our so-called x-axis, what you call you know, in your you know, x and y axis that you want for positional information. So this positional information is further elaborated to make different parts of the body. And similarly, I'll not get into the detail. We have another axis, X, Y, you know, along the Y axis, along the what you call dorsoventral axis, which is again another, you know, gradient of a protein molecule. And with the help of two gradients, this is the, the B, what is shown in is, is a cross section of the embryo, and A is showing at the longitudinal axis. And as you can see here, the, the gradient of the two proteins are good enough to make a two X and Y axis, and you can basically assign position values to every cell in that field. And obviously it will be bilaterally symmetrical because only two axes are used. And in way, indeed, uh, Drosophila is bilaterally symmetrical body, right? So this molecular mechanism, which is very similar across all uh, organisms, uh, including human, and there are many, many examples uh, how to use, you know, study this and how, what is the use, utility of such studies. One of them is, for example, Drosophila can actually be a model for many, many human diseases, including cancer and also congenital defects, into, for example, polydectyly in human. But of course, it's not a disease, it's just a, you know, a variant in human. Uh, but there are many, many here, you know, diseases of human can be modeled using to suffer Parkinson, Alzheimer's to, you know, variety of different other types of diseases. So I'll finally, you know, in two minutes, I will explain something about understanding the self, because this is where our cognitive understanding has to come. Because finally, we fear understanding that I'm different than all the other people who are listening to me, or I'm different than my computer screen, which is non-living and I'm living, right? All of these things comes only when we understand how our brain functions. And then only I can understand a little bit more about finally so-called self, and then that completes understanding of life. We have a lot of understanding of life at the, 
at the, at the chemical level, at the cellular level, at the whole organism level, including very different parts of the body, how we metabolize glucose and all aspects of it. But still, we need to understand the, the, the way the brain functions to finally to understand so-called the life in, in the way we need to want to understand. So Drosophila is a very good organism to study this. There are a variety of different types of behavior you can maintain, how it, for example, maneuver itself, or why some organism cannot maneuver like this one in the, in the, in the picture, this one on the right side, or when why two flies are fighting, what happens when one wouldn't, for example, loses the fight, what is will be reaction? For example, will it learn something based on experience? Or when there are two flies are to move towards the food, one goes faster, one goes slower. Why, you know, one goes slower? Is it because of some defects or is it because of some, you know, uh, per, per prior experience and that it is actually consciously taking a decisions not to move faster, right? So some of these kind of experiments one can do with using Drosophila as a model system. And even more complex decision it can take. For example, a fly, which is to move from one end to another end for food, right? And let's say you create a gap in between, right? It's a walking, you know, it Drosophila can be made walking if you just clip the wings and it will survive perfectly all right. It cannot fly, but it has to walk. But if you increase the width of this, right, what happens here, that a fly which is coming from the from the other side, now it is it is hungry because you are not given the food for some time. There is food on the other side. It can see it can, this food, it can smell the food, but you have created a gap, it has to cross the gap. But you have made the gap much more wider, right? And then see what it does. Actually, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't even make an attempt to cross the gap. It has. It can actually take a complex decision based on whether it is distance is crossable or not. But distance is crossable or not depends on its body size. A smaller fly will consider a, a, a narrow wide width you know, gap as something crossable, not crossable. Whereas a larger fly will consider a, a wider gap as not crossable. That means it has to have an understanding of its own body's dimensions. So to some extent, this is what awareness of self, right? We are aware of our body. We are aware of our self, right? Similarly, a even a fly can have awareness of itself, its own body. These are the very in intelligent experiment people have designed to even monitor and measure and evaluate to what extent a fly can have awareness of self, right? I'll not, you know, I'll stop this. And then now it is actually, it's going extraordinarily in a different direction with the help of data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Now people are trying to map in the brain all things that goes on when fly does something. For example, if a fly smells something, these are the number of neurons which will be involved. If a fly, for example, is infected, let's say coronavirus or a bacteria or something, right? The brain goes through a lot of, model, you know, interesting modulations and it senses a signal to delay the egg uh, laying. Because they, once a female lays the egg, if the area where there's infection, the next generation also will get infected. So one way the female does is, if, if it senses that I'm infected, I should not allow my you know, progeny to get infected. So it actually delays the egg laying itself. That whole process of, you know, you can actually you know, visualize going, what's going on in the brain, how it makes you know, such complex decisions you know, uh, you can uh, understand with the help of flies, but of course this requires huge, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, number of people, you know, working together. It's, it's a totally a mission mode interdisciplinary project. We need physicists, chemists, engineering, mathematicians, statistician, data scientists, particularly AI and machine learning people. All of them, if they come together and understand, even to understand one, you know, small insect's brain, you need to put in so much of effort. And you know, think of it how to understand a uh, human brain, which is you know several order more complex and much more you know uh, 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 bigger and more neurons and so forth. Right? I'll stop here, and I'm happy to take some questions. Sorry if I sort of took longer than I thought. Um, in, in my, I'll stop sharing for some time. And okay, Sonia, was it okay? Uh, was was it too long? No, no, I think it was fantastic and I uh, wish we could see a few more movies. The movies were mesmerizing and uh, it's amazing to even see how a small little insect like a Drosophila can take decisions. And uh, again, um, you know, how uh, we could draw parallels with humans, uh, you know, to um, in, in their effort to succeed or just give up. So I think that was fantastic, Professor. Yes, there are quite a few you know, questions. You know, there are a lot of interesting work, you know, you know, some undergraduate students have done, you know, in, in many places where, 
a fly if it loses the fight when it it's you know it's in the, into fight with another male you know uh, and if it consecutively loses two or three times it memorizes its experience and it actually stops getting into any fight for, a, for another few more days until it forgets that it has actually lost the fight for some time so it typical very similar to what we do it right but we do it more complex way because we have you know more complex experience obviously and okay. but then you know, the whole fact that uh, a small little organism which we feel that you know has nothing you know a small little uh, minuscule uh, size brain uh, can take such decisions and the the the, uh, the memory is still intact for quite a while is something that uh, it's really really amazing to you know and the awareness of it is really amazing exactly. and there's and so no, much to really yes. learn from that but no but what we have to really understand is but we, should, we don't need to really uh, you know uh, interesting point is the fundamental mechanism is the same from the cellular to network level from drosophila to human a yes. single neuron how it behaves on a, new, a network of neurons so extrapolating to what we learn from drosophila to human is not that difficult it's although it's a couple of order higher uh, magnitude uh, yes. in terms of complexity but at the same time uh, you know uh, the uh, fundamentally it's the similar kind of mechanisms right yeah. uh, so just a few questions uh, professor yeah uh, there is this question which says that can you guide me in understanding if computer science and biology is a good combination to study since the uh, student is interested in both subjects it's very much in fact uh, you know modern days you can't do anything without uh, you know having the computational skills uh, not only you need to learn some basic computational skills i think understand you know having a good skills in data science particularly the modern ai and ml is going to be useful to study any aspect of biology for example cancer biologists want to study you know very different aspects of uh, cancer progression you need to look at thousands and thousands of different types of cancer cells and then compare them right again it's humanly impossible because if we try to do it we'll be very biased the whole point in science is to to make our observation unbiased Correct. and the computational you know science data science will help us to be as unbiased as possible right and it makes it a lot ah. simpler because you have right. the software and you have oh. the data no no but simpler doesn't mean that it is you know any less intelligent or any less complex the whole is one because so, it also depends on how you collect the in data right that's that, where you know the experimental people will help Correct. collection of data also should be as unbiased as possible yes and at the same time analyzing the data should be equally unbiased it's better to be blinded that's where the data science will help right now there is one question here now that there is this whole uh, corona virus that has taken the entire world by storm can the drosophila play a role in finding a clue to understanding the corona virus and you know maybe finding a cure for it well not really to some extent uh, you know there are two aspect to this one aspect is our fundamental you know anatomy and physiology of the organism for example there are certain kinds of immune system like our innate immune system is uh, is similar to uh, drosophila and human right there is there are a lot of similarities so a lot of understanding of our innate immune system that is the first level of defense system what innate immune system means and how uh, we fight an infection is 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 relatively well understood using drosophila in fact drosophila the first one to be used for that study in fact the nobel prize for and discovery of innate immune system came from people who were using drosophila as a model system whereas the much of the fight body fighting with the virus is using adaptive immune system that is only what is present in vertebrates for that you need you know a mouse model or a primate model with not drosophila model. and the second point here is the whole virus itself evolves so much it develops lots of host specificity right that's why right you know this zoonotic disease is a rare thing that once in a century it's happening because it's very rarely once in a while it shifts from one host to another host this time it is from bats to human through some other right. intermediate so because of this long uh, evolutionary uh, you know coordination between the host and pathogen and the whatever the way this virus infects human would be very specific to uh, you know humans and bats mammalians compared to a virus infecting you know if insect right. like drosophila correct absolutely uh, there is a question here which is quite interesting 
when we talk about evolution, nature is constantly evolving. So is it possible to predict what's next for human beings? No. Some... So, no, I'll tell you what. So the, the evolution, we can study better in hindsight with, as a history rather than as a... As a uh... Right. Uh... There are a lot of genetic variations that are generated and these variations, when they are subjected to environment, uh, you know, confronts the environment, some are selected, some are not selected. And variation themselves are pretty stochastic. For example, whether I develop a variation in the gene related to glucose metabolism or in the gene related to fat metabolism is anybody's guess, right? It's pretty stochastic. I may develop one of the, you know, in one of these genes or may not develop in any of these two genes, right? Right? So, but in tomorrow's environment, if sugar is more and fat is less, or fat is more or sugar is less, will depend on whether my variant, whatever the new variant that I generate, will be useful for me or not. Whether it will going to kill me or whether it's going to help me to survive and, and procreate more. So that's why it's very difficult. It all depends on the environment too, right? So, but in the case of human, because of the modern medicine, we have actually delayed the evolutionary processes. Typically, you know, in, if we had left to natural cause hmm. because of the plague or because of the coronavirus, people would have, let's say, died in millions. And those who survived the ones who are naturally resistant to the virus. But now with the modern healthcare system, we try to keep everybody alive, irrespective of whether they have natural immunity or not. Right. And because of this, the natural so-called natural selection is somewhat limited in human. And so, it's if our infrastructure continues to be like this, if you protect the environment and you know uh, you know mitigate the climate change as much as possible, it's very likely for a couple of thousand or few more you know thousand years the human species may remain like this without any major change. Right. <clears throat> right. There is another interesting question that uh, between the uh, Drosophila and humans. Uh, what percentage of DNA similarity do you find? Okay, so, uh, you know, the, the, <clears throat> again, it is the question the person who has asked if he knows a little bit about DNA. For every, DNA is made up of a single units called nucleotides. There are four different types of nucleotides. And, and a sequence of three nucleotides corresponds to one amino acid in the protein. Now, to change for the amino acid to happen, any one of the nucleotides can change, but sometimes some nucleotide change will not lead to any change in the protein because there are sometimes uh, there are multiple codons for the same amino acid, right? So in, in the DNA level, usually there will be more variations between organisms. At the protein level, there will be less variations because proteins are the functional unit. Any variations in the protein will lead to some major phenotypic change. It may or not may not help the organism to survive in a given environment. So that goes under the Darwinian selection method. Right. Whereas the DNA itself can actually float in the population even if there are lots of variations. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that way, what students should ask is to what extent our proteins are similar to you know, the Drosophila proteins. It turned out to be that there are, uh, of course, there are more genes in human than in Drosophila. Yeah. But amongst all the genes that are present in Drosophila, 70% of them are very, very similar to human proteins to an extent that I can take human protein and put it in Drosophila and replace the Drosophila gene and fly would be still normal and happily living. Okay. To that extent, there are similarities. That's interesting. Um, there is a question here again, because now the, the, with this disease that is going around. So in an ideal scenario where uh, once a disease mechanism has been found using an animal model, what would be the next steps to study the disease in humans. Sorry, I, 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 what the first part I didn't get. This. What is the step step to? Yeah. So if you are uh, using an animal model, if you have found a, you know an, a scenario where you know a disease has been uh, seen in a you know to see seen to affect the uh, fly, how would that? How would you interpret that and move ahead with? Okay. Um, you know, moving ahead with the research uh, regarding the disease, ha uh, you know, being caused in a human. Okay. 
in human. So it's very simple. You know, this is precisely what we've been doing in the last six years in my laboratory with the help of my PhD students and other students. So what we did was to do a screen to identify genes when they are not functional, we get cancers, right? Wow. So for example, there are genes which basically are, you know, uh, if they're switched off for whatever the reason, for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. or, you know, because of mutations or otherwise, and we may develop cancer. So there are particular genetic method we adopted to identify close to about 500 such genes. Now, each one of them, we looked at which, what is the corresponding protein in human. There is a particular, using the data science, you can do this. You, all these requires huge amount of data, you know, skills in data, you know, high degree of skills in data science. And then we, you know, each one of them, we looked at in the human cells, what it could be its function. And if we knock that down, will human cell also develop cancer? Right. And which type of cancer it may develop. For example, not all genes will be you know, present in all the cells. Depending on which cells the proteins are expressed, accordingly, you can say, okay, perhaps it may cause skin cancer or a colon cancer or a lung cancer and so forth. So this is the kind of study one would do. There is a systematic method by which one could do. And I can always explain uh, you know, by our email to the, current, you know, the student who asked this question. Okay. That's nice. Uh, um, how far does cognitive parallels between humans and fruit flies go? Because you have been drawing these parallels and we just saw the movie. Uh, how far would you, uh, you know, um, take that? Well, you know, well, of course, fly is a fly and human is a human, right? Yeah. But to an extent that I can't even compare a fly to mouse or a fly to even another fly. For example, honeybee may behave differently uh, than a Drosophila, right? Although it's not a fly, of course, a bee and this is a fly, right? To an extent that, you know, the, the, depending on the environment in which living, the kind of life history they have, you know, life history means over the you know, evolutionary time scale, they would have developed certain way of living. For example, honeybees, they have made colonies, the, the females, except one queen, they don't produce their own children. They go around and you know, scout for uh, you know, the nectar and then send other honeybees to bring the nectars. And you know, variety of way of they live. Whereas the flies usually are solitary insects. They live in their own you know, individuals only for mating purposes, the male and female come together. That's why whenever two males come together, they actually fight with each other because they are competitors now. They never live together as a social group. Right. Whereas you know, primates usually live in social groups, right? And we, we, for example, including human, we live in social groups. To that extent, there will be different types of life history traits and accordingly, they will have many, many differences. So obviously, fly will not be an answer to everything. But as I'm telling you again and again, the fundamental mechanism to framing variety of different kind of features mm -hmm. that we have are the same small variations in this mechanism can lead to some changes, right? For example, if you understand a, 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 a four-stroke engine, right? It can run a bullet motorbike or a car or, you know, let an aeroplane or whatever it is. You may actually see that there are very different versions of a vehicle, but conceptually they all use a similar kind of engine, right? Fundamentally is the same. So similarly, we are looking at the engines the mechanism, right? What are the physical forces? What are the chemical, you know, reactions and forces? And how the environment, you know, interaction will change the way, you know, the way we live, irrespective of what kind of genotype or what kind of genetic material we carry. If you understand that aspect and easy to extrapolate to human and understand in the human context how we do what we do. It's not that Drusavala will be able to answer everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, how uh, was Drosophila used in the study of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's? A lot of work has happened, I know. Yeah. How so was Alzheimer's, to start with Alzheimer, Alzheimer is basically a problem in the memory cells, right? We forget things. So yeah. as I told you, Drosophila also has memory because it mm -hmm. can memorize many things. There are very simple ways of looking at whether Drosophila has forgotten or remember. For example, you, you can train fly to distinguish between two different types of you know, I'm sure many of my our students must have heard about Pavlovian dog experiment, yes. right? You uh, similarly, you can actually show fly 
uh, uh, something, and then if it is always associated with sweet, it actually puts out its you know proboscis. It's equivalent to let's say our tongue, mm -hmm. right? Now, if it is associated bitter, it will not put out its tongue, right? Then it, this is basically depends on the memory. Mm -hmm. If the memory is lost, then it cannot do this. It has to taste and then find out whether it's sweet or bitter, right? right? So you can actually do this learning and memory kind of experiment with it and see whether it has some early Alzheimer trends or not. Then you can look at the cellular level. It is because of the memory cells actually becoming defective at the cellular level. And is that defect is similar to the defect that we see at the cellular level in our uh, memory cells under microscope when you compare, right? For Parkinson, it is the, it is the coordination between the brain and the, the moving parts, right? Leg and other things. Yeah. That coordination, if it is, again, how the information goes from the brain to the muscles, if that is somewhere there is a defect, right? You see that there is a loss of coordination and you can study in a very similar way that happens in human. And in fact, people are using now Drosophila for drug development against Alzheimer's and Parkinson. You can screen for drugs, which, you know, reduces the phenotype or the disease manifestation. Right. In fact, uh, that was another question that has come up, and I think we'll end up with that question because of shortage of time. Uh, so the question I'll just read out, Drosophila is an excellent model to study human diseases and is also used as a platform for finding drugs. Are there any drugs that have been discovered using the fly in preclinical or clinical trials? Okay. So obviously, you know, when you say clinical trial, you know, by definition, it has to be using human subjects. So it yes. can't be Drosophila. Correct. So in preclinical trial, Drosophila has been used, but in a way, Drosophila is used not in the primary screen. The primary screen, you screen millions of molecules. Although these are very small inside, you can grow in the lab easily, but that scale at which you want to screen, uh, you know, even Drosophila is not very good. So that's where people use some other, you know, you know, uh, high throughput drug screening method using cell lines or many times just using the protein, a single protein, right? But in this context, where Drosophila is useful to understand the specificity of the drug and the mechanism by which it, you know, functions. So, for example, you already know there is a protein, which, uh, sorry, a drug, which helps in reducing the, the plaques that is formed in the memory cells in Alzheimer patients, right? So, you can actually understand to some what extent it is specific, efficient, there are no side effects or toxicity. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, whether it is a permanent or will have a relapse, you know, variety of different things and looking at the mechanism and everything, you can study this, right? Then do one more level of, you know, uh, you know study using a mammalian model, which is important, like a mouse. Then only drug authorities will allow you to go for clinical trial. You can't do clinical trial directly from Drosophila. Okay. Okay. Uh, so one last question, because we still have just about a little time, and this is for school-going children. I think it will help them. Uh, at the 11 and 12 level, they have to do project work, be it CBSC, be it ISC. So can you suggest any experiments that can be done you know, at the school level, uh, specifically uh, experiments that can test uh, you know, complex decision-making skills? So... You know, the, the, the picture that I was showing, uh, sorry, the movies I showed, some of them, that can be done in the school. You don't really need major any setup. You can sort of, you know, make small, uh, you know, uh, small blocks and then use, uh, you know, uh, a magnifying glass. You don't even need a major, you know, microscope or just a simple stereo microscope, which many schools have to see the, you know, you slice the leaf and then give the students to see under microscope how a, you know, a cell of a leaf would look like, right? The cells of a leaf. So that kind of microscope is good enough. And, and nowadays with the help of mobile, you can actually take videos. And, mm -hmm. you know, and now, uh, you know, Manu Prakash has also developed what's known as four scopes. And using such kind of methods, you can do many, many, you know, uh, experiments using simple flies. One is, you know, aggression, right? Social behavior. For example, what is the behavior of the flies when they are in, in group? But when they're taken it separately, to what extent they fight versus a fly which is always lived alone, and then how does it behave when it comes across with another, you know, male kind of thing? A lot of this, of course, already been studied. Doesn't mean that you know there is still you know less to study because you also need to understand that many of these studied using you know under one certain conditions. You can also vary the conditions, 
and also you can take the flies which is from the you know kitchen and then grow them in the lab and then study this rather than uh, a laboratory grown fly for 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 ages right for 120 years you know one particular strain is being studied in all our labs but that is behaves maybe differently than a wild fly so a lot of interesting work can be done thank you that was interesting in fact any kind of hands on uh, experiments in itself will become very interesting for the children even if they even if the study has been done earlier elsewhere if a child is able to use a fly to do it and you know works on it in the laboratory i think it's going to be fantastic for a child and very very inspiring uh, uh professor shashi thara i really cannot thank you enough for this really enriching one hour that we spent here thank you so very much i'm sure there'll be many many students who are going to be very inspired to follow your footsteps in the arena of bioscience and uh, a big thank you to the audience for the questions that have kept this discussion alive and uh, to ashoka university again for making this happen um, i really look forward to more such sessions and uh, i will definitely be attending and i'm sure a lot uh, uh, from amongst our audience many will be attending uh, these sessions that uh, you are going to be having hereafter uh, vikram thank i you. hand over thank the screen thank you very much you. before i thank vikram so takes much. over on thank my you. side thank you very much uh, you know uh, sonali for moderating this i really enjoy talking to you know you in fact through you talking to students thank and you answering their questions and um, i wish there was more time for more questions i'm sure uh, you know some other time and uh, thanks vikram for uh, making me the first speaker of this uh, series and i'm sure um, you know you will take forward and have more talks and i'm sure you'll be a better speaker in the next week onwards thank you thank you very much thank you thank you vikram thank you professor shashidara thank you sonali ma'am for your valuable time i think it was a great start for the season of uh, scientifically speaking and i'm sure our audience enjoyed the session as much as i did i would also like to thank the organizing committee for their support and feedback without which the series would not have been possible the committee comprises of 11 distinguished educators from schools across india they have graciously spared the time and expertise to help us curate the season of scientifically speaking we will be sending a recording of today's session via email to all registrations and the video will also be available on ashoka's youtube channel i would also request all our participants to take a minute to fill up a feedback form so that we can constantly work on delivering excellent lectures the link to the feedback form is in the chat box and we will also have an email to you Our next session of scientifically speaking season 2 is on July 28th and the speaker for the session is Professor Shriram Ramaswamy from the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore. His session topic will be living matter and matter brought to life. It promises to be a cracker of a session. The registration link for this is also available in the chat box and we will also be sharing the invite over email. Thank you again for joining us today. If you have any further queries regarding today's session or would like to know more about ashoka's unique interdisciplinary science programs you can visit our website at www.ashoka.edu.in or write to us at apply@ashoka.edu.in or call us at the number shown on screen see you on 28 july at 7 pm take care and stay safe